Okay, he joins us. Bill Federer. William J. Federer is a nationally known speaker, best-selling author, and president of Amera Research, Inc., a publishing company dedicated to researching America's noble heritage. And they got films, documentaries, books. It's just amazing. I, some of this is used in my children's schooling. Bill's America's Minute radio feature is broadcast daily across America and on the Internet. His Faith in History television airs on the TCT network on stations across America and via DirecTV, AmericanMinute.com. Uh, Bill, thank you so much for joining us. Alex, great to be with you. Well, Hillary's just openly stolen the nomination. They admit uh, Sanders was the winner. Uh, you, you hear about all the censorship going on against patriots, just Americana folks that are classical liberals. They call us conservatives. Uh, where would you say our republic is right now? Well, you hit upon it when you talked about the concentrated power and then the, the free market, the separated power. And this is a theme that goes back to the beginning of recorded human history. So writing was invented around three or 4,000 B.C., Sumerian cuneiform on clay tablets in the Mesopotamian Valley. Uh, that's three or 4,000 B.C. We're around 2,080. So that's around 6,000 years of recorded human history, which is not that long. It's only 60 people living 100 years each back to back. So we're basically talking 60 grandmas, and you're all the way back to the beginning of recorded human history. But what do we see in these records? 2,000 years, 33 major Egyptian dynasties dynasties ruled by pharaohs. 5,000 years, 18 major Chinese dynasties ruled by emperors. Cyrus of Persia, Nebuchadnezzar, Darius, Alexander the Great, Indian Maharajas, Julius Caesar, the Byzantine emperors, Muslim sultans, uh, African chieftains, King Kamehameha, and then of course these global empires, right? Genghis Khan killed 30 million people from Korea to Hungary, and then the king of Spain, France, and Austria. But the most powerful king in recorded history was the King of England, and he controlled 13 million square miles and a half a billion people. Now, I do point out that communism is nothing more than monarchy. Every communist country has a dictator, Stalin, Pol Pot, Ho Chi Minh, Castro, Mao Zedong, the Communist Party members. North are Korea the is a hereditary dictatorship. Yeah, uh, and the Communist Party members are the new royalty, and then the people are the peasants. So, so, so basically, socialism, communism is a monarchy makeover. But there's this undeniable trend for power to want to concentrate. Now, our founders, when they had a chance to set up a government, they wanted to run as far away from a king as possible. They took the power of a king, broke it into three branches, separated it federal to state level, tied up this federal Frankenstein with ten handcuffs. It was Eisenhower that used that Frankenstein term. He said the states created the federal government, but Frankenstein-like, the creature wants to destroy the creators. And so there's this trend of gravity, wanting to pull the satellite back down. And so... Uh, it was good that Lincoln ended slavery, but in the process, a lot of rights went from the states to the federal government. It was good that Franklin Roosevelt wanted to end the Depression, but he concentrates power with his New Deal programs. It was good that Lyndon Johnson wanted to end poverty, but he concentrates power with his welfare state and Nixon's war on drugs. And Bush, it was good. He stopped more terrorist attacks, but he concentrated power with the NSA and the Patriot Act. And now the new president, no matter what the crisis is, the answer is the same. He doesn't have time to be limited by Congress. He has his pen and his phone, and he wants to concentrate power. And so this is a natural trend, but you have philosophers that actually want to speed it along. Machiavelli, Hegel, Karl Marx, Saul Linsky. And just in a nutshell, Machiavelli lived 500 years ago in Italy. Italy was a bunch of city-states, Venice, Genoa, Naples, Florence, Siena. They all had armies and navies and fought. And Machiavelli thought if one prince could control all of Italy, it would stop this infighting. So he writes a book called The Prince, where he advocates the ends justifies the means. The end of one prince controlling all of Italy is such a good end, because it'll stop this infighting, that any means necessary to get there is justified. Lie, cheat, steal. So if a prince conquers a city, the city would hate him. But if the prince paid criminals to kill cows and burn barns and create crisis and terror, the people would cry out for help. The prince would come in and get rid of the very people he bribed. Nobody would know the better for it, and everyone would praise the prince as a hero. And it's, it's actually good marketing. You create the need and fill it. You go around the back of the house and set it on fire, and then you go around the front of the house and sell them a fire extinguisher. And that's Cloward and Piven, which has been adopted by the Democrats to bankrupt the country so they can then take it over. Right, and they get to be the heroes in the process of taking it over. And this 
uh, Machiavellian strategy influenced someone named... And that's why they brought in 5 million radical Islamics into Europe, 80% military-aged men. Now that they attack, I said this two years ago, now they attack, they declare civil emergency and arrest Germans and Swedes and Frenchmen that criticize the Islamic invasion. So the very government that brings it in is now the hero taking your rights but still won't fight it. Another term that you described is called psychological projection, blame shifting, where the attacker blames the victim. So the person that is accusing the other of being racist, the accuser is that is actually the racist one. Somebody's saying, well, you're uh, rich people, class warfare. Well, it's the accuser. There's a David Axelrod. I actually saw him at the Republican National Convention and said hi to him. And anyway, he was on NPR radio 2010, and he said, in Chicago politics, we have a tradition where you throw a brick through your own campaign office window and then call a press conference to accuse your opponent. <laughs> sure, and that later got, that later got put in the House of Cards. That letter got put in the House of Cards. And, um, well, uh, wanted to throw in Hegel really quick. Napoleon conquers Prussia, a German province, so easily that the king said, we can't let that happen again. We need to strengthen the state. And so Hegel was the philosophical basis. He says, the state is God walking on earth. And he came up with Hegelian dialectics, a way to concentrate power. And it's a triangle. One corner is a thesis. The opposite is an antithesis or antithesis. And the top corner is a synthesis. And didn't he just codify the uh, whole false flag of Machiavelli? You, you've got it. And it is. it sounds complicated, but it's actually s simple. You start off, you create a problem that's real bad, and everybody is happy to settle for your answer that's half as bad then that becomes the new thesis starting point, and you create another problem that's real bad, and everybody's happy to settle for your answer that's half as bad. You do this over and over till you move from the people ruling themselves to a king. And so uh, Karl Marx applied Hegelian dialectics to politics. How do you create a problem that's real bad? You send in organizers, agent provocateurs, provoking agents, agitators. Their goal is to find those who have grievances and tension right under the surface, and you stir them up to riot and have random killing and bloodshed, and then everybody is willing and begging some strong leader to come in and restore order. And I don't think I've ever seen in, in U.S. politics since I've been alive, or just in history, period, a time when the Democratic Party particularly is literally invoking classic Hegelian dialectic destabilization program. Let me ask you if you agree with that statement, and then B, Mr. Uh, Federer, uh, AmericanMinute.com, is it going well for them? Um, well, you're, you're hitting it right on the head, and I applaud you for uh, speaking and explaining this to the public. I find so many people, uh, you know, Lenin called, uh, he used the term useful idiots, people that are actually caught up in thinking that the issue is what they're talking about. Saul uh, you know, uh, quote David Horowitz quoted from him, he says, the issue is never the issue. The issue is revolution. <laughs> and so what Karl Marx did, he would send in these agitators, and they would organize the uh, proletariat against the bourgeois, the working class against the business owners. They'd organize the blacks against the whites, the Muslims against the Christians, the Catholics against the Protestants, the Hutus against the Tutsis in the Congo and Rwanda. They really don't care who the two sides are, and they, they don't care what the issues are. They just want a destabilizing crisis that's so bad that everybody begs a strong leader. Now, it actually works best if the people are not Christian. Why? Napoleon said... Religion is what keeps the poor from murdering the rich. So if you have poor Christians, they'll just forgive. They'll just, you know, suffer. And offer That's why globalists uh, target Christians worldwide, real Christians, because they don't conform to this dialectic. Right. And so you get these people that uh, have raw human passion, and you say, you've been wronged. You want what they have. Follow me. You'll get it. And once there's a destabilization of social order is when this strong leader usurps power. And is that over. why Muslims seem to be the perfect patsies? Well, yes, uh, Mohammed used this tactic. He would come into a town with their scimitar swords, and they would do random violence, and the town would say, well, what do we have to do to stop you? He would say, submit. And they go, okay, well, we submit. What does that mean? Okay, uh, men, get your sword and your horse, follow me to the next town. And so the larger group would go to the next town, and they'd do random violence, and the people would say, what do we got to do to stop you? And they'd say, submit. And then he'd say, okay, get so your sword and your horse. So it's called terrorism. He's been employing terrorism for 1,400 years. Yeah, and... Uh, 
Now, there's lots of Muslims who have backslidden, but every now and then you get those wanting to follow Muhammad's example. We call that getting radicalized. And so Muhammad I wrote a book how he transitioned from being a religious leader for 12 years in the pagan city of Mecca. And he uh, is not very successful. He only makes 70 converts in 12 years. And so the people of Mecca decide that Muhammad is a disturber of the peace because he's getting confrontational. They chase him out of town. Muhammad has nowhere to go. He is a Muslim refugee. He goes 210 miles north to a Jewish city called Medina. The Jews are nice and tolerant. They let Muhammad in as a Muslim immigrant. He goes into the minority neighborhoods, and he organizes a following amongst those who have grievances against this Jewish-controlled city. And he gets a following, right, organizing in the community. And when the following is big enough, he goes to the Jews and pressures them to accommodate him and his followers politically. The Jews do, and now Muhammad is a political leader in addition to being a religious leader. Then Muhammad's followers in Mecca get confrontational argument threatening. They get chased out of town for disturbing the peace. They're Muslim refugees. They go to Medina, the Jewish city. They're nice. They let Muhammad's followers in as Muslim immigrants. And Muhammad allows his followers to rob the caravans headed to Mecca in retaliation for the Meccans chasing them out of town. So where Jesus said, if they take your coat, give them your shirt, Muhammad's attitude was, if they take your house, you retaliate, take their caravan. So Muhammad had 300 warriors, and they would rob caravans. He got a whole chapter of the Quran, it's Surah 8, chapter 8, on how to distribute booty from robbing And then we caravans. wonder why all this is happening, and then as soon as the Muslim mayor gets elected in London, he starts restricting free speech, says he's going to ignore the law. They're following a program of conquest. Why does the left merge so seamlessly with the totalitarian orthodox islam uh because they claim they're all liberal but there is a love fest between the the uh, technotronic uh, folks and islam oh well david harowitz said that the union between the radical left and radical islam is the most dangerous uh, uh thing that's happening in our era. And so the uh, radical left hates Judeo-Christian values. They hate the concept of the individual. They want everybody to conform to the state. Uh, and Islam hates Judeo-Christian values, and they want everybody to conform. So they sort of see themselves uh, as partners uh, against traditional Judeo-Christian values. Yeah, they hate the West because it's open. They can't compete with it. So they got to blow it up and bring in their system of tyranny. They cannot compete with the free market. They cannot compete with classical liberalism. And now, there's no honor among thieves. They don't like each other. Sort of like you see those movies where, you know, a couple bank robbers will rob the bank and they're dividing up the money. And uh, the one pulls out a gun and shoots the other and he gets to keep all the money, right? So, so they don't trust each other, but they'll use each other against the West. Um, but it is, we've always thought of communism on one side, Islam on the other side. Well, the Muslim Brotherhood is a cross-pollinization. Well, Bill Federer, you were on many years ago. I don't know how it fell through the cracks. You're just a superstar of history. I hope you'll start coming on routinely. Come back and let's talk more about uh, this, and we'll take calls. Thank you, sir. I'd be glad. All right, Bill Federer was probably on the show four or five times over a decade ago, and then I saw him at the RNC, and it was like seeing an old cousin or somebody that you hadn't seen him forever, and you for, for, uh, forgot what good friends you were with him. Well, in this case, I've read his books to my children. I've shown his lectures to him. I've, I've seen him here and there on cable, heard him here and there on the radio for... Gosh, that's got to be 25 years. I mean, before I was even on air, unless I'm wrong. But I, mean, I remember Bill Federer. And so it was just like, wow, this guy deserves to be heard because I know history. And this guy knows what he's talking about, like, squared, you know, to the next level to what I know. And I, I know way more than most people. And then I, I feel ignorant because history's so big. You meet this guy and, and, and read his stuff. I mean, it is dead on. And so uh, we just talked during the break. We're going to start carrying his American Minute. Uh, here on the radio and TV, uh, and also clips of his larger lectures. Uh, he's got a new book, The Rise of a Tyrant. We're going to talk about that for about 10 minutes, then go to your phone calls and let him go. But just important work, AmericanMinute.com. Now, before we go back to him, we're running the biggest sale in our history. Once a year, we do a super sale fundraiser. And we do it with 40% off, great vitamins, minerals, nutraceuticals, Hillary for prison shirts, uh, great uh, air filters, Technology's gotten so good, it's normally about 250 bucks for $180. Comparable units are $400 or more. I'm going to tell you, because three years ago, I bought units that were almost $1,000 that are basically the same. So stuff's getting less expensive, but still, most people gouge you for similar units for $400. It's 180 Alexa Pure Breeze, 20% off regular retail that is still a steal. Uh, water filtration systems that are gravity-fed, Alexa Pure Pro. No association with me. This is just the best unit out there. Those are 20% off. Pro Pure water filters that are excellent, 20% off. 
InfoWarsStore.com or InfoWarsLife.com for the supplements. And uh, again, all of those purchases make what we do here possible with the news teams, the reporters, the crew. And we are doing everything we can to just really, really bust our butts. I mean, I'll be honest. Our crew lately, the last few weeks, has been working 18 hours a day. And I haven't even had to tell them to do this because they understand what's happening is so historical. And I've never had a better crew. I've had great crews over the years, you know, 20-something years. But I, and some crew have been here like 15 years, like Paul Watson. But they are godsends, and I am so blessed to have them. So thank you for your prayers. Uh, thank you for your support. Thank you for spreading the word. And thank you for supporting our local AM and FM affiliates and also UHF, VHF, and cable stations. Support those sponsors. Let them know why you're supporting them. Uh, support those stations. Send them 100 bucks. They're doing everything they can to bankrupt and shut down talk radio. They're doing everything. They, I've been kicked off so many stations, even though we have high ratings and, and make stations money. The stations go, we're sorry, Alex. They came with federal money for these federally produced programs, and we need it. It's $300,000 just to take you off the two hours you're on on the weekend. And, and they apologize to me. And I say, please don't, you know, say the station, but as soon as the money's gone, we'll put you back on. I mean, they're making a move against free speech. You see the censorship everywhere, but it, it's not stopping us. But we're one of the biggest groups, though. Little people are getting shut down because all of you together are much bigger than InfoWars or Matt Drudge. But believe me, if they can take down Fox News, there's a coup there right now, and they're doing it. Matt Drudge is next. Alex Jones is next. So I'm not complaining. I'm just telling you, we are two minutes to midnight here. But it's because we're having such inroads against tyranny that the enemy's moving. So we're forcing them out in the open. All right, Bill Federer, let's, let's get into any other key points you want to make. Get into your new book. And then I want to have you back for a full hour uh, in the next few weeks. And we really appreciate your time. Well, human behavior is predictable. There's a saying, past behavior is the best indicator of future performance. And so that's the advantage of learning history. Now, if you take a map of Eurasia right before America was discovered, you got China on one side. And for 5,000 years, they had 18 major Chinese dynasties. And if you wanted to have a republic or a democracy, the emperor would show up with a 100,000-man army and rip the walls down around your city. So China has really never had any experiments in self-government. The other side of the map is the Mediterranean. And you've got islands and rocks and storms. And uh, it's very hard to have a dictatorship with all these variables. And so it's in the islands of the Mediterranean we see the next step of people experimenting. Because there's places to hide. There's places to hide. Right. And so if we focus on Athens, around 622 BC, Athens had a king named Draco, and he had Athens' first written laws. Now, this was a step up because prior kings could rule on their whims and caprices, and they'd kill you and take your farm. And so the people of Athens says, look, King Draco, at least write these laws down. He did, but it was the death penalty for every other thing. So they got nicknamed Draconian Laws. That's where that term came from. Well, in 594 BC, they get a new king in Athens named Solon. S-O-L-O-N. Salon invented democracy. And in democracy, everybody every day had to go to the market and talk politics. And if you didn't keep up with politics every day in Athens, you were called an idiotus, an idiot. And uh, now if there's a king, an emperor, and you have an agenda, you got to get in to see the guy. Like China, the emperor had 2,000 concubines and Mandarin eunuchs that kept them, and you'd bribe these mandarins with money just to get in to pitch your agenda. Well, in Athens, there was no emperor. The people made the decisions. Well, if you have an agenda, how do you pitch it to the whole city? They would get the whole city together in an amphitheater and put on plays, comedies and tragedies where they'd ridicule and buffoon certain points of view and honor and extol other points and of view. And this brought in high culture. And from that time till now, theater and entertainment is always political in a country where it's the people making the decisions. And I could get into more of that, but someone I wanted to mention is Plato. Now, he lived in the Athenian democracy, and he said the government would go through five stages. The first stage, he said, was rule of the capable. These are people that know how to run farms and businesses. They know how to run city government. They're just responsible. They do a good job. The city grows. The second group wants to get involved in politics. Plato called them lovers of fame. And these are people that may be a Greek actor and are a Greek Olympic athlete. Everybody knew their name, and they get involved in politics, not because they have responsible experience running a business, but because they were famous. Maybe like a Hollywood action figure that gets elected governor of California. You think, what did the Arnold run before he became governor? Nothing. He was just famous. Now, these famous people like fame, and they hate being defamed. So these you can manipulate with public opinion. So the first ones, they're going to do what's right because they're responsible. The second ones, they'll bend. 
And so the second group begins to yield to the human tendency of avarice, selfishness, and they vote a little money out of the city treasury to pad their retirement. They're working hard after all. They vote a little money to their brother-in-law's construction company, a little money to some supporter that can funnel it back into their campaign. And it turns into a third category, which Plato called lovers of money. It's an oligarchy. It's a rule of few. It's an insider clique. And if you're friends with the people that are inside, you get the pork projects and the, all the extra, you know. And so waivers. productivity starts going down. So now things aren't going as well. Now the fourth stage. And so it turns into this division in society, and the people finally throw the bums out and set up a democracy. This is the fourth stage. And in a democracy, everybody learns how to tolerate each other. It's great. They tolerate, you know, all kinds of behavior. Then they tolerate people that are a little bit off. Then they tolerate people that are a lot off. So finally, they're tolerating open crime and convicts and all kinds of immorality. And Plato even says this, the manner of life is that of Democrats. That's his word because he's describing a democracy. Every man does what is right in their own eyes. The young man gives into libertinism and useless and unnecessary pleasures, even incest and unnatural union. Yeah, that's what he's talking about. And they throw off restraint. And it's just anything goes, and then they raid the city treasury, and now there's a shortage. And they say, where can we get more money? The rich people. They t tax it from the rich people. So then comes the tyrant. Life. And then it turns into this chaos. They don't have a, they have a shortage. And, well, don't cut back on what I'm used to getting. And it turns into this tug-of-war and anarchy. And then they begin to say, can't someone come along and fix this mess? And that's the fifth stage. Someone comes along, Plato called him. First, he appears above ground as the protector. And he's very eloquent and persuasive and gives these great speeches, and people fall in love with him. And then they notice he's beginning to concentrate power too much, and he loses in the, the public opinion polls. And they cast it in his teeth that he's getting too powerful, and he has a choice. Give up the power, which he's not inclined to do, because Plato called him a lover of power or get rid of the people confronting him. So he purges his military and his administration of, of anybody that has virtue. He doesn't want people with virtue. He wants yes men. And then who does he get to be his new friends now that he got rid of the old ones? He frees the slaves, the convicts, the criminals, the illegal aliens, and he arms them, and they become his mob that he sends around to punish anybody that disagrees with him politically. And so here's what Plato wrote. And the protector of the people having a mob entirely at his disposal, he is not restrained from shedding the blood of kinsmen by the favorite method of false accusations. He brings them into court and murders them. And, and, and so he uses this power of the state to go after his political enemies. And uh, finally, he stands in the chariot of state holding the reins of power, and he's revealed as the tyrant. And then and so, over time, the society declines. But the weird thing about Plato is, and I've, and I've read his Republic and other writings, and of course, he's the model of everything today. Is it's, it's very dual because he'll admit all this bad stuff, but then talk about eugenics and getting rid of masses of people because we're crushing the breast of the earth. And then you know he also uh, uh, pushed some really tyrannical stuff because he understands all of this. He talks about Plato's cave and you know how we're controlled. I mean, it's, it's all genius, obviously. Uh, but but I, I don't know if duality is the word or the paradox of Plato. Can you can you speak to that, uh, Bill Federer? Right. He said that democracy is a temporary form of government because people really don't have virtue. If they're given the choice of giving up their virtue or giving up their life... So you have to have a republic that guards certain codes so the mob can't vote the other half be their slaves. Right. And so he says the best you can hope for is a nice tyrant, and he called him a philosopher king. But then he says this. He says, so... Uh, the tyrant. Then comes the famous request for a bodyguard with his, um, in other words, there's threats on this tyrant's life, and the people are all concerned about him, and they let him. This is uh, a false coup. This is like what happened in Turkey, right? Uh, and so there's this threat on the guy's life. And, you know, Sergei Kirov is a famous Russian that uh, was praising Stalin. And uh, Stalin was a little threatened by him because he was getting too popular. But Stalin also had another problem of these anti-Stalinists. And so Stalin had an idea. He would murder his friend, Sergei Kirov. Nobody would blame him because they're such close friends. And everybody would blame these anti-Stalinists. And so he murders them, blames it on the anti-Stalinists, uses that as an excuse to purge the Soviet Union of over a million people. And so this is this staged coup type of thing. Bill Federer, absolutely. That's exactly what we're talking about now that's happened in Turkey. Expanding on that then, looking at this, what phase would you say we're in right now? Because obviously these phases are in flux. Things are so complex now. There's pieces of every phase. Thomas Jefferson first, you know, he talked about uh, the yeoman farmer. He said, we've got to stay de 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 decentralized. We've got to stay local. 
and we've got to stay near the earth or we'll become decadent slobs. He believed, as a classical liberal, that that was the way to basically short-circuit this slouch towards Gomorrah. Can you speak to that as a historian? Well, when the public opinion of the quote-unquote protector begins to go down, then he throws off the charade. Why try to give this uh, fake front that he's in favor of the people? He just throws it off, and he becomes a dictator. And so it's like a cornered animal, and when they really get in the corner, the fangs come out. And if they – we think, oh, Republicans get a turn, Democrats get a turn. We're talking global power. We're talking this 6,000-year quest. Now, Hillary may Hillary openly Rodden. steal the election. I mean, she is already stole the nomination. She's already committing crimes. She's already by the law. She is. She is a – uh, tyrant ready delivered. I believe if she's put in office, she will become Tyrannus Maximus. Uh, yeah, uh, she uh, would r extract retribution on all those that disagree with her. Uh, it's sort of like electrons. What we're seeing is it, it's a struggle. Uh, is, is it power from the bottom up or power from the top down? You know, King Louis the Fourteenth was called the Sun King, and his subjects were the planets that revolved around him. Louis the Fourteenth said, I am the state. And he even said, it is the law because I wish it. Lo and behold, the law was just the king's will. So let it be written, so let it be done. Uh, yeah. In America, we said, we don't like that. We want law from the bottom up. And so what we're experiencing right now is this electronic polarity struggle. Is it going to be... So you agree, we're in, a, we're, we're in a galactic crossroads of flux point. Which way do you see the tea leaves going? Um, well, uh, uh, it, I, I have to look at it from somewhat of a spiritual perspective to get any hope. And it's what stories do we like in the Bible? Well, it's David against Goliath. It's uh, Moses against Pharaoh. It's, you know, Gideon against 100,000 men. In other words, it looks hopeless. And then little nobodies with faith and courage stand up and, and things turn around. And that's what I'm uh, hoping for and, and praying for. Uh, if I looked at it strictly from the natural, you'd think, gee, uh, the, from, from Nimrod and the Tower of Babel to Genghis Khan to Tilda Hun, and the, and these empires keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, clearly with a global perspective as as an ultimate goal, you know, the George Soros wanting to, and so um, this And by the, the way, you know George Soros is proud of his Nazi collaborating, 60 Minutes, and I've read his writings where he says he believes he's a messiah and a Christ. He's clearly a megalomaniac mental patient. I mean, why isn't he locked up? Well, I, I mentioned uh, before that I lived in Missouri. I was half an hour from Ferguson. 99% of the people riding in Ferguson were not from Ferguson. They were all brought in, part of the old Occupy Wall Street people, but it was more Missourians organizing for reform and empowerment. And you can go to Snopes, and it even says it's a George Soros-funded group. He put $30 million into it. And they organized the rioters. They actually advertised in Chicago papers, you know, go to Missouri and organize. And, and, uh, and not to empower black people, but make them be the detonator switched to bring in tyranny, and then they'll get the blame. Yeah, I mean, the mayor of Ferguson worked on my campaign when I ran for Congress back in the year 2000. I ran against Dick Gebhardt. And, um, and so the scenario is you have a Democrat governor that tells the National Guard to stand down and let them riot for three days till it makes national news. Then you say our local police departments are inadequate. We need to federalize them. Strong cities initiative, shared data with the federal government, and then the same people were moved to Baltimore. It's a rent-a-mob, and the Democrat mayor lets them do a billion dollars worth of damage, and afterwards they say our our local police department's inadequate. We need to federalize it. And so they're going 53 cities now, Denver, Colorado, and they're coming in, setting oversight. And basically, it's giving the federal government, Department of Justice, Homeland Security, control over the local police departments. In other words, it's giving the president a standing army. Bill, I tell you, I really want to get you back for a full hour in the near future. I'm going to go to break and take a few calls here for folks that have been holding. Uh, really amazing, AmericanMinute.com. Uh, I, I, I'm really excited to hear you're going to join us once a month on the radio, once a month on the nightly news, and talk about all the books you've written and the uh, e-books and the DVDs and the uh, fiction. This is something everybody, uh, in fact, I've, I've given this to my children years ago. I'm like, wow, Bill Federer, I've got to go get all, I'm, I'm not just pitching this. It's, it's true, folks. I mean, he's not a sponsor. I'm really doing this. I've got to go get some more of your audio CDs and MP3 files for my children. They love this type of information. My daughters and my son, they're so informed because of your work and others. And so uh, there's just so many great jewels like yourself out there. And I hope that people will go get these materials and, and, and really discover that humans live 75 years on average, as the Bible says. And we, we all think we're really different. But at the end of the day, we all kind of do the same stuff over and over again. And uh, there are manipulators who know this knowledge but use it against people.
And just knowing real psychology, real history, history is real psychology. That's an Alex Jones quote. History is real psychology, not pop disinformation. And if you know it, you know how we act. Just in business, knowing history, knowing human nature, I'm so much more successful in the fight for liberty. And I just uh, you wish the general public knew that knowing history gets you ahead, not behind. 30 seconds, Bill Federer. Well, I just want to thank you for having the courage to bring all this to light. And, uh, you know, I think you're one of the, the ones that's being raised up to educate our country. And uh, there's always hope, uh, but there's something for every single person to do. You know, our founders flipped it and they made the people the king and the politicians the servants. And so those that are listening to this program, you're the king. The politicians are your that's servants. That's right. And if we throw that away, we deserve to be slaves. Bill, have a great weekend. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. We're talking to Bill Federer very soon. Your call straight ahead in the fourth hour with Rob Dew. Infowars.com. We are running the biggest special we've ever run that we started running Wednesday. Most of the specials will continue through the weekend. A lot of things are about to sell out. We are going to have to stop the 40% off on super high quality storable food tomorrow. But everything else... Uh, well, a lot of the other items is going to run right through until Sunday evening. The purchases, whether it's the supplements or whether it's Hillary for prison shirt or whether it is a film or a book on any subject of geopolitical import you can imagine from the occult to 9-11, your purchase of these high-quality products is what makes this operation possible. We have the amazing nootropic, normally $29.95. Uh, similar formulas are $60 to $70. And people get them from doctors, even though they're not prescription in the U.S. This has ingredients that are the highest quality nootropic. has building blocks that your brain needs. 1776, and we will sell out of that by next week, so I have to end that special. 40% off Brain Force, 40% off Silver Bullet, Colloidal Silver. This was sold out until a day ago because it came back in. I'm still doing it. 30% off our flagship product, DNA Force, with the Bio PQQ and more. 20% off all Pro Pure water filters, 20% off all Alexa Pure L air filters. We already have the lowest price on all of this. 30% off all Survival Shield X2. 30% off all Super Male Vitality. 30% off Vitamin Mineral Fusion. 30% off Secret 12, Vitamin B12. 30% off DNA Force. 20% off all Survival Seeds. The biggest selection out there, lowest prices. 20% off all T-shirts and other apparel. 30% off all Liver Shield. 30% off Deep Cleanse, Parasite Cleanse. 30% off Anthroplex. Similar to Super Metal Vitality, but a little less expensive. This is the dry formula. 30% off Knockout, the amazing sleep aid. And I want to salute and thank everyone who has been taking advantage of this sale, who have been wearing the Hillary for Prison shirts. You're making the news around the country. You're showing the power of grassroots activism. You're lighting the way to the future, even if they flip on the internet kill switch of how we're going to resist at the grassroots level with information warfare. This is the beginning of the long march against tyranny. So listen to me. I want to thank you for your support. I want to salute you. And I want you to know, when you fund us, you see the action. You see more reporters, more stories, more, more devastating payloads in the Infowar fired at the enemy with spectacular results. If Infowars was a submarine, we've sunk thousands of globalist cargo ships, battleships, weapons carriers, missile cruisers. And now we want more submarines, more weapons to go out and devastate the enemy. No one's ever stood up to them. All we're doing is standing up. You stood up with us. Your funding is essential. Thank you.